you've done over 450 episodes on this subject matter. So productivity at the root, it has this word in it called produce. And I don't mean like vegetables and all of that, like produce, but producing is what it is. Embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't, and get stuff done. Like David Allen said, your brain is for having ideas, not for holding them. A more modern version of getting things done where it's all about the power of a second brain. From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoke or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. And do we have a treat for you today? I have somebody who's had over 10 years of experience podcasting, been the host of a long running podcast called Beyond the To Do List. And if anybody ever types in productivity and the word podcast in any app, you're bound to find this particular podcast in probably the top 10 at least. It's a podcast that I listen to a lot. It's inspired me in so many different ways. And I'm super excited to have the host of that podcast here today. He's not just a legend. He is the Mr. Miyagi of productivity, in my view. So Eric Fisher, welcome to the show. I'm super excited, as you can tell. Well, thank you for having me. I am honored that you chose the words Mr. Miyagi. I am a huge Karate Kid fan, so (laughs) you're speaking my language. So Eric, on this episode, we are going to explore a topic that I think many of us could do with, which is choosing the right productivity tools. But before we delve into that, for any of the listeners who have been sitting under a rock and don't know about your podcast or yourself, could you give us a bit of background about you? Sure. Yeah. Well, again, you mentioned the show I've been doing beyond the to-do list for over 10 years now, started it in August of 2012. So, so actually we're almost to 10 and a half years at some point here and uh, yeah, started it because I was doing podcasting in various co-hosting roles. Previous to that, I was doing a show for, I think about three years as a co-host called social media serenity, how to do social media without going crazy. (laughs) And at that point in time, the host of it decided to phase the show out and focus on less shows, they were doing multiple shows. And so I thought, well, this is a chance for me as this show is phasing out to figure out what I want to do. I thought maybe I should start a blog. And I'm like, why would I start a blog? It's podcasting that I want to do. And so it took about six months to really land on the topic. And once I did, you know, I was going through the process of saying, well, how do you get to talk to people that you want like like this? How do you talk to people and learn from them? And what do you want to learn from them? And, And just going through that show formation process, it was like, well, I want to ask them about how they do good work. How do they manage their time? How do they? And as I was starting to list these things out, I thought, and listing potential guests out, these topics and names started to make me think, well, this is a productivity show, but it's not just a productivity show. It's about going beyond the to-do. That's the name. And I was like, beyond the to-do list. And so it kind of just went from there and it's been fun ever since. But yeah, in the meantime, I've held various day jobs. It's always been a side hustle. It's grown over year over year continually. At some point here, it's going to continue to grow just like the podcasting industry, which is great. I've seen lots of things grow, change. You know, it's been interesting. Some people call me an OG. There are a lot of other OGs that are that have been out. You know, that were, I was a podcast listener at the time others were podcasting, but I joined in, I started in 07 doing like a comedy podcast with a friend of mine for a year. And, and actually iTunes put us at one of the top new comedy podcasts that December when they did their lists at the time. So not a lot of people know that one. Ah, I might ask you to tell us your favorite joke towards the end of the episode. (laughs) You got time to think about it. We'll see. (laughs) And just like you, Eric, I mean, I wanted to start a blog. This was a few years ago. And what I found was I just kept writing and then deleting, rewriting, deleting. It just was never perfect enough. And I kind of procrastinated a lot about blogging. And in the end, I just jumped 
feet first into podcasting and have never looked back. I mean, I talk like I've been doing it for years. It's literally been a year on this podcast. And then I started another podcast before that, which got me really excited about it. So it's just interesting how for some of us, having a conversation is like the best way to share our passion, I think. So that's really interesting to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I mean, there's something to be said. I mean, we can talk all day about how the power of podcasting and there are whole shows about that and episodes about that in those shows, but there's just something about audio specifically where you can do other things, but you're still maintaining your full attention on it and you can mm. learn and be entertained as you're not just as you're doing other things. I like to take walks and even work out and hit the treadmill while I'm listening to something. There are certain shows I have selected for that, but yeah, it's become a part of my routine. Yeah. I mean, just for your information, I usually listen to your podcast when I'm doing the school run. So I go and pick up my daughter from school and, and I find the journey in your podcast length is like just perfect because by the time I get there, I'm halfway through the episode and then I'll drive back. So it just fits that, that time, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Drive time's perfect for podcasts for me too. Yeah. Awesome. So Eric, we're going to talk about choosing the right productivity tools. Before we do that, can you define productivity for us? I know I heard you define it on another episode and I thought that was a really good place to start because it's quite a scary word for a lot of people. Well, there's, I, you know, I'm a word nerd. So productivity at the root, it has this word in it called produce. And I don't mean like vegetables and all of that, like produce, but producing is what it is. And we kind of tend to think of it in that way. Often we think producing something, making something, doing something. How much did you do? How much did you make? And then it starts to trickle down into, um, well, is what you made something that was good or was it just cranking widgets? You know, is it just a matter of, okay, you've got your template down and you just efficiently fast, more fasterly. None of these are words. You just Crank that widget faster, in other words. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people are looking for from productivity. They want to get more done because there's never a lack of things to do. There just isn't. And for me, though, I kind of tend to go with the other side of what people kind of subconsciously or hidden in their brain have as a meaning for the word productivity. And for me, that stems from this idea that if I see my son sitting on the iPad for hours on end, one, I feel guilty, but two, <laughs> I think to myself to say to him, hey, why don't you put that down and go do something productive? Well, in that case, we're not talking about doing more because he did hours on end of a thing. So is, was that not productive? Well, no. What we really mean is something worthwhile. Are you spending your time on things that are worthwhile? And that's really my definition for productivity. It's if you were productive, if you at the end of the day, you feel productive, you call yourself productive, you, you claim that day as a productive day. If you can point to something, anything, even if it's not a lot of things and say what I spent my time on was worthwhile. That's kind of the definition I want to go with. And I love that because I think there are times when we need thinking time, but we feel guilty because we're like, well, I'm not doing. And actually the thinking is going to super accelerate your doing when you get to that point. And so that's probably far more productive than me actually producing some widgets because yeah. I've put a lot more thought into it. So yeah, I love that. And so Eric, what are some of your favorite productivity tools? Could you share some of those? Because you've done over 450 episodes on this, this subject matter and, uh, and you've Probably talk to some of the greatest minds in productivity as well. So I'd love to get your distilled version of some of those tools. Well, three that jump right out to me that I use constantly all day, every day. Number one, it's text expander. That's one where you basically have at your any whim, whether the, and this is mobile and desktop at any point in time, if I type in X HP, for example, is my shortcut for headphones the emoji of headphones because I use that pretty often. And it's like, well, I want to remember to have that. And I can just type XHP instead of tapping and holding on the keyboard, going and finding that one, copying it, pasting it. It saves me so much time. So it, it's this way of calling up even not just emojis, which is the smallest, most simple character you can think of. It's a singular character, but like 
whole paragraphs of, hey, this sounds great. I would love to do this. Let's book a time here. Well, that's like X Cal. And I put X in front of it because that's text expander X. Pick that up from, I think, David Sparks and the Mac Power users at some point in his text expander Orioles or something. But um, creating all these different snippets that then call up this text at any given time and make it so I don't. One, I don't have to rewrite it over and over again. And I know what some people are thinking. Well, why don't you just have it pre-written and then open the doc in Google Doc, go copy it, paste it, et cetera. Do you really want to know how much time that's taking you? I don't think you do. Instead, have it at the ready and just memorize some of those keystrokes. Or again, it lives in the bar up at the top or in your menu of your keyboard in your mobile. And you just tap it. So, oh, there it is. Tap, paste, or, you know tap the T in my little menu bar here on my Mac and it does a drop down, and I can scroll and find it if I don't remember. But most of these I've used so much that the neural pathways are formed. I know what that one is and that one is the most frequent ones at least. So there's different tiers in there. So that's text expander. Um, let's see what else. One password is my password manager of choice. I have just found that like, for example, when signing into an app on my phone, Oh my gosh, I've got to find out what, like I've got to, I want to have strong, secure passwords, but I also don't want to have to then look it up and then manually type it over and over again when I need to. Or as I recently found out, one of the best ways to use one password is to like, for example, if you're logging into things on your Apple TV, all your different channels, it's like, okay, what was the password for that? Again, I've got to look it up and hold it on my phone and then use the remote to tap, tap, tap all around. No, instead, you just swipe down and use the the Apple TV app, remote app on your phone, and 1Password works with it, where it's like it detects what app you're trying to sign into, whether it's Netflix or whatever, and you just tap it, it populates it, you hit return on the TV, it's accepted it, it signs in, oh my gosh, saves me. Like instead of logging into everything for over an hour, it took me like maybe five to 10 minutes to start up a new Apple TV that had to be replaced and all set and done. So one password saves me so much time and so many headaches. And then the other one that comes to mind that I'm constantly using is Brain FM. And if you've not heard of Brain FM, it is basically music engineered with science, varying degree, varying genres, classical, a little bit of techno, a little bit of atmospheric classical, all these different things. But what's in it is it's got these tones and binaural beats, if you've heard of what that is or it sounds. And what that does is by putting on headphones and listening to this music, it gets your brain waves to a certain place that you want it to be at sooner. So what that means is if I want to focus, I can select that. There's relax, there's sleep, there's meditate. And then in each of those, especially like in focus, you can go into focus and have like deep work or creative flow or studying and reading or even like light work. If you're just doing admin stuff, relaxing has a bunch of different ones like de-stress or unwind, different things like that. So, and even sleep, sleep helps you. It, it'll get you like, it'll help you get asleep and stay asleep. And I know some people don't want to sleep with headphones, but I typically do actually. So those are three that I'm using constantly to save myself time help myself get focused and get stuff done when I designate the time for it and make sure that, you know, my passwords are secure and I'm not spending tons of time searching for them and trying to remember things and resetting things all the time. I have to say, I more recently started using certain apps now to help with productivity, especially automation, because up until now I was doing everything manually and even the podcast sort of editorial process was very manual. And I absolutely now see the power of automation because there are some really cool apps out there that help with that. I want to focus on the Brain FM app yeah. that you mentioned there, because I think before we continue, here's a quick word about the sponsors of this show. So you execs have decided to go through a big transformation to change your ways of working. They've restructured the teams, invested in new tools and techniques, but there's one small problem. How do we measure our improvement consistently 
across the organization without falling into the trap of relying on what we call vanity metrics. Yup, those KPIs that look great on paper, but just aren't very useful. I want to introduce you to Comparative Agility. It's the world's largest continuous improvement platform. There you've gathered over 4 million data points from thousands of organizations so that you can benchmark your maturity against the world index or compare yourself to your industry. They have a wide range of different surveys covering topics such as business agility, psychological safety, DevOps, employee engagement, and many more. What makes these surveys so valuable is that they've been written by respected thought leaders who are experts in their field, such as Mike Cohen from the world of Agile, all the way through to Dr. Amy Edmondson. So whether you're a coach, team manager, or a transformational leader, be sure to check out Comparative Agility to help implement a culture of continuous improvement. Best of all, you can test drive the platform completely free. To find out more, check out the link in the show notes. Now, let's get back to the episode. When you build a certain mood in your mind, then you seem to get more engaged with something. So I can see the power of that. I think that would be phenomenal because there's times when I'm just sat here a little bit kind of brain dead after a hard day's work. And it's really hard to motivate yourself and get yourself focused on something. I mean, how have you found that? How, I guess, uh, impactful is it when you do put on that sort of music? Does it work or is it a gimmick? So for me, it works. And that's the disclaimer is like, and there are others out there. Like, I'll give you an example. Another one out there is Focus at Will which I have also used and I have a lifetime subscription to it. I paid for it years ago and have alternated to it at different times. I don't feel like it's a gimmick because I feel like when, like, for example, I think a day or two ago, I needed to sit down and get in the zone and focus and do a specific task that was going to probably need to be worked on for a good somewhere more than an hour, but maybe almost to two hours. And the thing is I sat down, actually at the time I was standing because I thought I need some, I need to get my energy up. So I stood at my standing desk, which right now I'm sitting, but, but I noticed I wasn't getting into the zone. I was about 10, 15 minutes and I'm like, something's not right. What's going on? And so I got up, got some water, came and put the standing desk down and sat and thought, oh, I didn't put, I didn't do, I didn't put in my brain FM. So I immediately got my headphones out, put them in fired it up. And then in about 10, 15 minutes, I was just rolling along without any problems. So I just, I mean, and there are times where I will grab it and use it on my phone with headphones, especially when traveling, like crashing and laying down on like the hotel bed for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour using the recharge method or mode in the relaxed section. It feels almost like getting a cup of coffee, but without the jitters. And it just kind of brings your body and your mind and your spirit just because your brain gets into that. It's called modulation. So it it basically locks your, it gets your brain locked into a a brainwave phase faster. And so that's going to be varying degrees of effectiveness as well as speed of which it is effective for different people. Fantastic. And talking about productivity and different tools within productivity. I was really keen to hear your views on some of the books and the literature out there as well. So if we now move to some of that literature, I heard an episode you released a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, or slightly longer, but it was about your roundup of the best books to buy on productivity in 2023. There were some phenomenal insights in that podcast. So I'd love to just delve into maybe some of your favorite. I know that was a long episode, so we haven't got time to go through all of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think we had like 20 something plus books in that episode. And of course it was all listening to, I was joined by my friend Jeff C and we walked through it. I think there was, all, I mean, in, in that episode, there was also like references to the different conversations I've had with most of those authors, as well as then a list, a link to a list of the like macro book level list that I had made. One that really sticks out to me is the one, The Lazy Genius Way 
which is by Kendra Adachi. And the subtitle to that is Embrace What Matters, Ditch What Doesn't, and Get Stuff Done. And, you know, all books have subtitles these days, multiple sections of it. But for me, basically, if I was to put it into quick words to summarize the book, The Lazy Genius Way, according to her, is being a genius about the things that matter and being lazy about the things that don't. And you get to decide and that then it's okay. And that's in, in most simplest terms, that's what I want people to approach productivity with is, look, you don't have to have the same priorities that are, as everyone else, you, whether this comes to your work, when it comes to your home, when it comes to, you know, insert here. Like, for example, I think one of the examples we talk about in that conversation was my friend Jeff does a lot of the at his house, but it's like, or her when talking with her, it's like, okay, well, family meals, that's a priority for us. Okay. It's all of us sitting down and eating together at a meal per day. And the thing is like, well, what's, what does being a genius about that look like? What does perfect, what does perfection or good enough look like for you in that instance? And realistically, it's not doing it every single day. Okay, well, then what does consistency look like here? And it's, you know, what if we say four times a week and that if it's more, great. But if it's less than that, then that's where we kind of course correct. But if it's four and we hit the four and we feel good about the four, then we feel like, and it's not just about that. It's about what's the sitting down and the meal represent value wise? Well, it represents us connecting. Okay, well, then if it's, you've also done the homework and drilled down and stated that, then that means if the four isn't possible, what are other ways to supplement and make sure that connection happens? So it's these steps that we don't always think of and curate into our brain and make priority of. And then it's like, hey, you know what? Then it's okay to not have, you know, all those different things be something we beat ourselves up over. Got it. That's one of the ones I really like. Yeah. And I was going through that list and just thinking, I've probably read like one tenth of that list that you talked about. So there was so much I felt that I was missing out on. And to know that you've actually spoken to all of these authors, it was absolutely phenomenal. I was really interested in some of the creativity books that help you with your creativity. And you mentioned a few in there. I'm trying to get up your episode now to see what could I find on there. So I'm always- Well, I will say this. There's two that stick out to me, actually more, way more than that. But the first one would be The Daily Creative by Todd Henry. That's a daily reader. So, and it, mm-hmm. and it draws upon all of his previous books to go into all these different areas. And, you know, the subtitle on that one is Finding or Find Your Inspiration to Spark Creative Energy and Fight Burnout. So, it's basically about having a boost of creativity and not just boost of creativity, but a boost or a bolstering of your creative process daily. It gives you something to read, to think about, to, uh, you know, file away into your brain and let it simmer as you move on day to day as a daily reader. And I really like that one. I really like Todd. In fact, he and I are going to probably try and do some more collaborative efforts for both our podcasts, like dual recordings to put on both shows. Sometime in the near future, we talked about it. Focused around this new book of his came out in October, November, somewhere in there, I think, of last year, 2022. So that's one that I really think is something anybody could grab. And honestly, if you were going to go for a Todd Henry book, go for this one because it's got stuff from all the other ones. The other one I'm thinking of is Tiago Forte's Building a Second Brain, a proven method to organize your digital life and unlock your creative potential. This is all about the benefits of not trying to keep all our ideas in our head. You know, we all know this, like David Allen said, your brain is for having ideas, not for holding them. And so Tiago takes it a step further. And in fact, it's kind of a modern day, a more modern version of getting things done where it's all about the power of a second brain, the setting up of one, kind of what you do with it. It's collecting. It's curious. I don't have the notes in front of me here as far as the specifics of the book, but I will say that it's all about capturing those ideas, getting them out of your head and into a trusted system, and then being able to use that trusted system to connect different various ideas that you've had, maybe something from a year ago with something from a week ago. And suddenly that week ago idea added to the year ago idea suddenly brings that year ago one, brings it new life to where you didn't quite figure out what it was, but you thought there was maybe something there. And suddenly 
those two things, maybe with a third one from yesterday. Whoa, powerful stuff. And that's what excites me is connecting those different ideas. It's kind of like having different conversations with people. You had one a year ago. I'm having one with you right now. I'm having one with somebody else later today. But like, what if there's this through line? And that's what the second brain does is it allows you to, in an organized way, collect and connect ideas and then execute on them. A lot of us, we see things on social media. We might see a great post and we go, oh, what a great thing. Or I'm going to come back to that. And then we get busy and we move on. And then we go, oh my God, I can't remember where I saw that. And you then try to find that thing again. What was really interesting was I saw an app somebody was talking about that you install on your Mac. I can't remember what it's called. It's something like Rewind or something like that. I might have the name totally wrong. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And it records all of your activity on your machine. And then it transcribes things as well. I think your Zoom calls and any kind of meetings that you have. And you'd think, oh my God, this is going to now totally blow up my hard drive because it's going to be a lot of information. But they somehow magically compress that into a tiny fraction of the size that we would expect it to be. And then you can just do searches and go, oh, let me just search for this word. And then you'll see it transcribed and you can start seeing exactly where it was referenced. Yeah, I think I've on, I I feel like I I saw this at some point. I think it's maybe Rewind AI. There you go. It has to have AI in there for sure. Of of course. (laughs) I think that might be it. I remember hearing a lot of stuff about this recently, a while ago, and then resurfaced recently in the past couple of weeks. Yeah. And it was just that idea of the second brain, but taking it to another level whereby you're not even having to paste in your links and things into another app. It's kind of already doing it for you in the background, which is kind of interesting. I thought that was really cool, but I've never used it. So if anyone has, let us know. I'd love to know more. Well, Eric, thank you so much for sharing some of those great tips, tools, and books. I'm sure people out there will find great value in those. I'll put some of the links in the show notes as well so people can find those books for themselves. So thank you. You're welcome. 